Hello, good morning everybody. Welcome to this service of morning worship for Emmanuel Morden for Sunday the 27th of September. Hope you're well. Good to be able to speak to you this morning, whether you're a member of Emmanuel Church Morden or whether you're watching or listening in from uh, somewhere else, maybe the local area, maybe further afield. It's good to be able to speak to you today. We're in this phase at the moment, aren't we, of having uh, a service in person here in the church building uh, on Sunday mornings. Uh, But at the same time, this service, this online service, pre-recorded and running at the same time, uh, and glad that you could join us. We're starting a new series this morning in the book of Jeremiah, which might seem a bit daunting. Jeremiah is one of the largest books in the Bible, the second largest, in fact, Uh, But uh, a time that I trust and pray will be really rewarding and rich for us as a church family as we study God's word together and find out a little bit about how God's word works. More on that in a little while. First of all, though, you'll see some words on the screen, a call to worship. Please join in with the words in the bold yellow type, if you would. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. And we're going to start by singing uh, together uh, a reminder of who God is, the everlasting God who doesn't grow weary. Isn't that great to know as we begin our time together this morning and all the way through the week? Let's sing together. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait.
we've just heard about who God is in the song that we've just sung, uh, and we've heard that our strength will rise as we wait upon him, but we need to be careful that we're not coming into God's presence together as a church, expecting him to do lots for us uh, without first of all acknowledging uh, how far we fall short of his good and holy standards. It's right that we say sorry to him at the beginning of our time together. And that's what we're going to do now. Again, you'll see some words on the screen. Please join in uh, with the words in the bold yellow type if you feel able to do that. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. And so we say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We've asked God to wash away our wrongdoing. Listen to these words from Titus chapter 3 in the New Testament. When the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared... He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Isn't that great news? The good news of the gospel, isn't it? That Jesus came to save us that God accepts us on the basis of what Jesus has done for us, not on the basis of any number of good things that we've decided to do for him. And that when he saves us, he washes us clean so that in his sight, we are clean, we are righteous. We are thoroughly accepted by him 24-7. So may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to hear our first Bible reading now, also from the New Testament. This is from 2 Peter, and John is going to read that for us. The first reading is from 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 16 to 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honour and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, low human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to start a new series today in the book of Jeremiah. Meet Jeremiah the prophet. Here he is, and we're going to be spending a lot of time with him over the next few weeks. His book in the Bible, as I said, is a giant book, so giant that it often puts people off reading it. Oh, that 
and the fact that it doesn't have a happy ending. The book of Jeremiah, the people to whom Jeremiah the prophet spoke, they ignored him. Jeremiah himself was taken away from his home to Egypt, and that's where he died eventually, and all the people uh, of his home were exiled. They were taken away as well. That was a calamity. We know that's going to happen right at the start of his book, just three verses in. We're told that's what happened to the people to whom he spoke. But they should have seen it coming if they'd listened to Jeremiah, because he spoke all about it. He told the people that they were sinning. He explained how God uh, was sad because they were sinning. Uh, and he warned them what would happen if they kept on doing the wrong thing. So they could not say that they weren't warned. Jeremiah warned them with his own words in which were God's words. And that's what prophets did. We've just heard that, haven't we, in that reading from 2 Peter. Peter knew that prophets spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's not to say that they started to sound different or used a different accent and a different way of speaking whenever they were carried along by the Holy Spirit uh, speaking God's words. No, they were using their own words. Jeremiah used his own words, but God used those words and spoke through those words. And we'll be thinking a bit more about that in a short while. So what about Jeremiah himself? Who would God get to do the work of speaking his words? You'd think that he'd want to get someone really important, wouldn't you? If you were the prime minister and you were hiring a new spokesperson to speak, you know, be behind the lectern at the microphone, you'd want somebody smart and quick and impressive to pass on your message every time. So who does God choose? He chooses a nervous young man from a village outside of Jerusalem somewhere. Someone who doesn't want to be a prophet because he says that A, he's too young, and B, he doesn't know how to speak yet. But that's God's wisdom, isn't it? He uses people who don't seem or feel qualified at all. And he uses them to share his word. What's more, God tells Jeremiah that before Jeremiah was even born, God had chosen him to be a prophet to the nations. So not just Jerusalem, but Jeremiah was called to be a prophet with an international ministry. How must that have felt? What do you want to be when you grow up? At various times, I've wanted to be uh, an astronaut, uh, an England cricketer, and a graphics designer for the BBC. And I've not made it in any of those areas yet. I'm still waiting for the phone call from the England cricket selectors. It hasn't happened yet. But seriously, if I'd been really serious about doing those things, I should have chosen to do some training long before now. However, in Jeremiah's case, God chose him, even while he was a baby, in his mum's tummy. And so what he was going to do with his life was mapped out for him. And we might scratch our heads and think, well, that's a bit rough on poor old Jeremiah, or should I say poor young Jeremiah at this point. But God gave him a cast iron promise. He would always be with Jeremiah and rescue Jeremiah. We're not Jeremiah, with words to take to angry folk in Jerusalem for 40 years. But if we are Christians, we can say that we have all been called by God to serve him and to spread his word. That is our calling if we're Christians. The New Testament says that. In fact, the New Testament says that God chose us before the dawn of time. And we might not feel very expert at serving God and sharing his word with people. We might tremble at the thought of it or we might kick against it. But if we stop for a moment, we will just wow 
at the fact that God has called us to do that. God has set us apart to be his very own, to do his will. He knew what we'd be like before we were even born. He knew that we would keep doing the wrong thing and going the wrong way and disowning him and letting him down. All those times, but still, he wanted us. That's amazing, isn't it? We keep messing up, but God keeps with us and keeps us safe in Jesus. And because we are in Jesus, we can, we can say that we are always justified. Bible words that we've heard before. What it means is God looks at us uh, in all our uh, imperfections, uh, all our weaknesses, like Jeremiah was weak, but when he looks at us, he sees us clothed in Jesus. That's what it means to be justified. And here's a song about that now uh, by Awesome Cutlery. Cutlery. For all of us, at every moment of the day, if we're trusting Jesus, we can say, it's just as if I'd lived Jesus's life. What an amazing thought. And here's a great song. When I looked in the mirror, do you know what I saw? I saw someone who had broken the law. God's perfection is too high for me. But he made a way for me to be free. Jesus died on the cross, do you know what he paid? I owed for how I disobeyed God's perfect son took on all my sin And he gave us freedom I'm safe in him He came, he lived, he loved, he died He rose again and he justified He came, he lived, he loved, he died He rose again and he justified Just Well, John's got the second of our readings for us now. It's the whole of Jeremiah chapter one. Before we hear it, I'll pray. Let's pray. Father God, open our eyes so that we might see wonderful things in your word to us this morning. And we pray that for Jesus' sake. Amen. 
The second reading is from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 19. The words of Jeremiah, son of Ilkiah, one of the priests at Anophoth in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The call of Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, Sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, You have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a pot that is boiling, I answered. It is tilting towards us from the north. The Lord said to me, From the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I am about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. Their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods and in worshipping what their hands have made. Get yourself ready, stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's the end of a week uh, in which we've all been gazing at our crystal balls, haven't we? Trying to work out what will happen next. There's a rise in cases of the coronavirus, tighter restrictions from our government. They may get even tighter in the weeks to come. We're waiting nervously and we want to know what happens next? What happens next? So who will you trust on that? The lowdown, the final word on what happens next. Now, there are plenty of possibilities, aren't there? We could trust one scientist or another. We could trust hearsay. We could trust something we've read on the internet. We could trust our instincts. But none of those will be absolutely 100% reliable. And the further into the future we try to peer, the more shaky the wisdom becomes. That is, apart from one source of wisdom, uh, one source which is and always will be completely reliable and utterly accurate, and that is the Word of God. 
we're starting today in the book of Jeremiah. I've already introduced you to uh, Jeremiah, young Jerry, uh, the reluctant prophet there in chapter one, who would become the weeping prophet. That's uh, what he's often known as. Uh, and we'll see why he has cause to weep over the weeks to come. And we'll see more of his life story over that time too. Right now, this morning, as we start this weighty book of the Bible, we're going to spend most of our time thinking about, well, the other star of the book of Jeremiah. And that is not the man himself, but the word, the word of God. Jeremiah was given God's word to speak to others. See that several times in chapter one, verse uh, two, the word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. Then he says, verse 11, the word of the Lord came to me. And again in verse 13, the word of the Lord came to me again. And look at that stunning moment in verse 9. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. You see, Jeremiah is commissioned to speak God's words, even as he speaks his own words, using his own lips and his tongue and his own vocal cords. It is one of the distinctives of the Christian faith that God has chosen to communicate with us through written words on a page. Here those words are verse 1, the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests of Anathoth in the uh, territory of Benjamin. They are words spoken by a man, collected and written down by another man who I'm sure we'll meet along the way. But at one and the same time, they are God's words to us today. We don't live in, in the last days of the kingdom of Judah the final days before disaster overtook Jerusalem and Jeremiah himself. We live in the last days before the return of Jesus. But now as then, God is still speaking. He is speaking through his words, which is there in the words of the Bible. Words that were spoken and written down by human beings, but at the same time breathed out by God for their original audience and for audiences in the years to come. And it's worth thinking about that for a moment. Jeremiah's first audience, as we'll see, were a tough gig. By and large, they hated what he was saying. And then verse 3, as we know, the axe eventually fell and they were taken off into exile. The exile from Jerusalem did indeed take place and then Jeremiah's words collected together served to remind the exiles why this disaster had come upon them and also to point them to the future. So do you see different audiences within a few hundred years? What about us? We are now a few thousand years down the line and we come after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which has opened the gospel to all the nations, including our nation. And still God is speaking to us, a different audience in a different time and place, listening to his sure and certain word in scripture. The challenges that we face are different to those of the people of Judah, but still that word of God in its entirety has the final say on what we can expect in life. We're free to listen to other sources of authority. We always need to listen to our government. We're obliged to do that as Christians. Scientific opinions of different sorts will be of interest as the days go by. But only the word of God tells us what will happen for sure, that this world is time limited that it will be wrapped up one day when Jesus returns. That may happen before we die or not, but until then, 
we had better pay attention to this word and to the God who makes himself known by speaking to us by this means. The word of God is the invisible star of the book of Jeremiah. This morning, for the remainder of our time, let's pay attention to that word and what it means for us. We'll see what can happen when God speaks and what will happen when God speaks. What, what can happen, what will happen. So let's go. Here's the first point. What can happen when God speaks? I'll read verses 9 and 10 uh, once again. Here's the moment of Jeremiah's commission. Uh, not the moment of his calling, because remember, that happened when he was a baby in the womb. His commission was the moment when he was given God's word to speak. Here's verse 9. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. So this young lad from a slightly obscure village is given words that God means to go global. And looking back at history, we have to admit that is exactly what has happened, hasn't it? Why else would we be looking at these words of Jeremiah in the Bible today? We'll see in this book the remarkable truth that God's word outlasts everybody. Jeremiah has long since died, but his words are still going and they're available to us in the Bible which is freely available all over the place. In this book, we'll see how kings tried to shut him up, uh, how they tried to burn his books, but they're dead. And God's word in the book of Jeremiah still lives on today. It's incredible when you think about it. These words have reached as far as Morden, London, in the United Kingdom in 2020, when they originated in the 6th century BC. We've got them. But look at what can happen when God speaks. There are six verbs there in, in, um, in uh, verse 10. Uh, it's really like a job description for Jeremiah. Uh, this is how Jeremiah is to use his master tool, the word of God, if you like. Uh, it's, it's his master tool. This is what it says. Um, I appoint you over uh, nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. So do you see those three pairs of words there? The first two pairs, well, they're more destructive words, aren't they? Uproot, tear down, uh, destroy, overthrow. And the last pair are more constructive, build, plant. And do you know, this is a fairly good summary of what we'll find in the book of Jeremiah. The destructive words of God, the words of judgment, outnumber the constructive ones by that ratio, about two to one. That's important for us to take on board right at the beginning. This word of God is powerful. It might seem at the moment as if a microscopic virus has more power to break down and cause chaos than anything in the world at the moment, but that's not so. The word of God will always be more powerful it can bend civilizations, it can topple kingdoms, and it has outlasted all of them so far, and it will do. But it is a word of grace as well. God uproots in order to plant. He tears down in order to build. There is work that he wants to do by his word, and he did that in his people back then, and he does it in his people today. Over this year, of course, we've had services online available on YouTube. Uh, later today, uh, we're going to gather around our devices for our delayed annual church meeting, which will include a short service with the breaking of bread to express our fellowship together. And we'll be there in our slippers, in our comfy chairs, maybe with a, a, a mug of nice hot tea on a coaster in front of us. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But one of the dangers of meeting in, in that way is that we might just get too comfy about the business of meeting together online. Uh, and in general, 
God doesn't want to make us comfy as Christians. He wants to make us holy. And that will involve being torn down and built up again by his words. I should say, if you're watching this, there, there may be good reasons why you're watching online rather than coming to the church building at the moment. But do you see the point I'm making? Uh, that God doesn't want us to be comfy Christians in any area of our discipleship. He is in the business of doing something destructive in us so that he can do something constructive. Being made aware that we're nothing without him Throwing ourselves upon his mercy, that's what he calls us to do, to hear his word of grace to us in Jesus so that he can build us up after that. Because Jesus is never an add-on, a mascot to see us through the, the hard times. Jesus went through the pain of death for us and in him we die to sin and are raised to new life. And all of that happens in God's word. Uh, as God's word gets to work in us. That's what can happen when God speaks, that work of breaking down and then building up again. But now let's find out what will happen when, when God speaks, uh, looking at the kind of the, the really big picture. What will happen as, uh, when God speaks? The word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah and Jeremiah is asked what he sees. And this is a bit like show and tell at primary school where that there's a picture uh, and God shows a picture and then God tells Jeremiah and us what the picture is about. And put very simply, what will happen when God speaks? The answer, fulfillment. His word will be fulfilled. There is no doubt about that. Coronaviruses will come and go. Empires will come and go. We will come and go as the Lord gives and takes away. But come what may, his word will be fulfilled. Here's verse 11. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, he replied. The Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. So it's not just a nice picture postcard here of a tree that God is showing to, to Jeremiah. There's a bit of wordplay going on. The Hebrew word for almond tree sounds almost the same as the word for watching. God is watching, and he's watching to see his word being fulfilled. <clears throat> Do you know, in the last few days, we've heard words that have been fulfilled uh, almost immediately. Pubs and restaurants will now close at 10 o'clock. We've seen some words that will take a while to be fulfilled. Words of financial support to some businesses from the Chancellor. With other words, such as the, the, the promise, the hope of a, an effective vaccine, we're waiting to see when that comes about. But you know, God is waiting to see the whole of his word fulfilled, and it will be. He's not waiting in doubt or trepidation. He's waiting for everything to happen in its time, just as he has planned, and it will happen that way. And we can depend upon that. Now, if you are a Christian, think of the great comfort that there is in knowing that God will keep his word. One day, you and I will be free from the presence of sin and we will have new bodies that are not prone to weakness or sickness or old age and we will see the Lord Jesus face to face. We are waiting with God for that day to happen and that day will be glorious. Think of the almond tree then. God is watching as he waits. He's not given up on this world. He's not absent the pandemic is not a sign of God's absence. It is a wake-up call to his presence, that his word will be fulfilled. Jesus will come again. The struggles and stresses of his people will be over on that day. And this broken world, which has so much sickness, will be made new. But look at the next show and tell from God, verse 13. The word of the Lord came to me again. 
What do you see? I see a pot that is boiling, I answered. It is tilting towards us from the north. And the Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. You see this image, the cauldron is boiling and the contents are spilling out on one side and that spells danger uh, and it's danger from the north. Pretty soon the people of Judah will have to face up to armies from one of the mega powers surrounding little Israel, not least the invading Babylonians. And God will send them in because God will judge his people. Now we'll find out exactly uh, why it was that God was so unhappy with his people back then in the next few weeks. But we know that it is true that this world is under judgment and rightly so. And if we are in Jesus, we have nothing to fear on that day. But outside of Jesus, we have a great deal to fear as we face the prospect of hearing God pronouncing the right and proper judgment on our sin, that we are as guilty as the day is, lo is long, uh, guilty of rebelling against him. And it is only by clinging to Jesus that we have any hope at all. Only by being found in him, the one who took our penalty for our sins on the cross and was raised again so that his righteousness might be our righteousness. So that God might look at us and say, it is just as if he or she had lived Jesus's life. So don't let this word of God wash over you. If you are watching, listening to this, you are not a follower of Jesus and you're here with us. As I always say, you are very welcome. We are really glad that you've joined us. But you do need to know that the clock is ticking. Don't put off trusting God's word and coming to Jesus until the 11th hour, because that's not why God is, uh, is warning us here. The intensity of his warning in this book of Jeremiah is there because he wants his people to repent and to repent today, to accept his word today. Perhaps as a Christian, you've become accustomed to Christian life in slippers, as I was describing, not just in terms of watching the telly, but in terms of your discipleship. Perhaps you know you've become casual about spiritual habits and you're not plugged into God's word as much. Perhaps you've drifted from him in prayer. For all of us in that situation, Jeremiah will be a bombshell to us in the weeks to come. We must wake up to the reality that Jesus is coming again and God's plan is to make us more and more holy before that day comes. Because his word will be fulfilled. He is watching. So it's time for us to get with his program. Jeremiah was given a stern instruction by God. Uh, verse 17, get yourself ready. Don't be terrified by opposition, uh, says the Lord, or I will terrify you. Those are striking words, aren't they? But they illustrate just how serious God was about Jeremiah's calling. And we're not Jeremiah, but as Christians, we all have a calling to live lives to the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And if we're casual about that, if we're regarding God's claims on our lives as less important than ticking things off our bucket list, then we're going to come a cropper. But trust in the God who is there watching and that his word will be fulfilled. And we'll want to be obedient to his word and to walk in his ways. And as we do that, like Jeremiah, we can be assured of God's presence with us always by his spirit, nudging us on, reminding us of our final destination, pointing us towards Jesus. Verse 19, this is what Jeremiah was told. I am with you and will rescue you, says the Lord. And he did do that for Jeremiah. He made Jeremiah into the bronze wall of uh, uh, verse 18, who came up against a battering for the 40 years of his ministry. Do you know there was no such thing as a bronze wall 
in Jeremiah's time. The, the British Museum has some bronze gates from Assyria that uh, date from that time, but they aren't really bronze. They're wood with some bronze overlaid uh, on top of the wood. They're strong, but they're not as strong as Jeremiah, or should I say, they're not as strong as God made Jeremiah, the puny, hesitant youth from Anathoth who didn't want to take God's word to the people. This autumn, as we look at Jeremiah together and as we face uncertain months as individuals and as a church, uh, let God make you a bronze wall, as it were. Be firm in the knowledge that advisors may come and go, but God is waiting for his word to be fulfilled, and it will. In your lifetime, things will turn out just as God has always planned and revealed in his word, so don't lose your nerve. Keep his word in front of your eyes. We're to do that as a church, aren't we? To rest on every promise of it and to know his presence with us by his Holy Spirit. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word to us today. Thank you for preserving it down through the centuries. Thank you that it will be fulfilled. And thank you that your power is undiminished. Your love for your people in Christ is as fierce as ever. And your promises have not failed and will never fail. Help us to trust those things for Jesus' greater glory. Amen. Well, uh, a few weeks ago, you might remember, before the summer began, uh, we listened to a new song about the great promises that are held out to us as Christian people. Uh, there at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, the imagery that's there pointers to the fact that in Jesus we have everything we need for these days and for all our days. Let's uh, listen again and sing along if you'd like to, to We Have a Lamb. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. For mistakes we can't forget And the sins that still beset We have Oh
aged years for all sweet and bitter tears we have a father we have a father for our treks through burning sands to our home in promised lands this In October, we're going to be running a short uh, series called Life Explored. Uh, you might like to get involved with that. Here's a little trailer for what it's all about. Before Jackie leads us in some prayers of intercession, we're going to declare our faith together using some words which you'll see on the screen. Uh, you'll see some questions. Please join in with the answers if you do indeed believe and trust in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as he's revealed in his word, the Bible. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? we believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church, this is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us start our prayers this morning with the collect for the 16th Sunday after Trinity. O oh Lord, we beseech you mercifully to hear the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may both perceive and know what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to fulfil them. 
through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, you called the prophet Jeremiah to speak up and stand up for you at a difficult time in the history of your people Israel, when many were ignoring your words and living their own way. We pray for our nation today, which is going through a difficult time with the upsurge of the coronavirus. We pray for our national and local leaders that they will be open to hearing your voice and that you will guide them in the right paths of action. We pray for the people of our nation that they will turn to you for help in these difficult times and help all those who trust in you to speak up and stand up for your guidance for living and for family life and to reach out to others with acts of love and kindness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, although we can't do church in the way we used to at present, help us to be aware and take advantage of what we are able to do. We pray for the new growth groups meeting on Wednesday evenings on Zoom while house groups cannot meet in homes. May as many as are able take part in these and help us to carry on growing in our faith despite the difficulties. We also pray for the Christianity Explore group that David hopes to start later. May there be people who are seeking you who will come along and learn about your plans and provision for us all. We also pray for the reopening of the groups using the newly decorated hall, that they will all meet safely. We pray for all the renovations in the hall and thank you for them and pray we will soon be able to use the hall for church activities. We bring before you the Zoom annual church meeting this afternoon, that there will be no technical hitches and that all the business will be accomplished. May we all feel a togetherness as we share communion in our own homes. For Jesus' sake, Amen. Let us remember those who are sick in mind or body, those children who are finding returning to school difficult, for those who are lonely or afraid, for those who are bereaved and mourning the loss of their loved ones and for any who are facing housing or financial difficulties. In the pause, name someone you know or someone from the church list before God. Lord of all comfort, we pray for those in need at this time. Lord, you see all that is going on in people's lives. You know what each one needs and we ask you to minister to each one who has been named before you by the power of your Holy Spirit. Fill them with hope and overwhelm them with your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our mission partner today is Charlie Lamont. We pray for him and his family as he seeks to grow the fellowship at St Andrews, both numerically and spiritually. May all the things they are doing on Zoom help them to grow closer together and to move forward in their church life. Help Charlie as he makes a video for Christmas which will be shown throughout the deanery. Encourage Charlie and his family even when things seem hard. Amen. Gracious God, we pray for David and those on the leadership team at Emmanuel at this time. We pray for all the churches in our modern parish as they have all started to meet back in their buildings. Encourage them as they seek to move forward safely and we pray for all the members of these churches, especially those still worshipping at home, those who are shielding or those who need lifts or those who just feel unable to come. May these difficult times increase our faith and cause us to draw closer to you. Remind us of the power of prayer. Help us to use our time wisely, to spend time exploring your word and refresh us all with your Holy Spirit that we might have the right words to say to those we meet at this time. Amen. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's conclude our prayers by saying together the Lord's Prayer. 
As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We've heard today, haven't we, how the Lord is in control of all history, how his word will be fulfilled. And our final song today uh, is a reminder that as we wait for God's word to be fulfilled, there are many, many reasons uh, to give thanks and praise to him for all that he has done in our lives. Uh, let's sing together. Uh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sin like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his hope Yeah. 
we've come to the end of our time together this morning. Uh, Today there is no Zoom coffee break at midday. That's because we're having our annual church meeting at 3.30 and we'd much rather that you came to that. So if you're a member of the Emmanuel Church family, uh, details of how to access that are in the notice sheet. They are the same uh, details that you would use uh, to uh, come along to the Zoom coffee break normally. So that's 3.30 this afternoon. We'll be looking back on uh, the previous year. Lots happened since then, hasn't it? Uh, uh, in the life of the church. We'll be uh, considering where we are at the moment. We'll be giving thanks to God in a short service after the annual church meeting, which will include the breaking of bread. So bring some bread or have some bread close to hand for that. Uh, we'll be sharing on Zoom in that way. It's an expression of our fellowship uh, as Christian people in Jesus, our bonds or fellowship with each other. There'll be another service again as we continue in Jeremiah next week at uh, the same time. Uh, right now, though, I'm going to finish with some words which you'll see on the screen. The Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.